three, two, one, Sebastian Velasquez. Back in the hot seat, man, but you're back in Greenville. First off, how you doing? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. So good to see you, bro. Always, That's, always great to be here. It's crazy, dude. We were just talking. You're going to see uh, Berea play, what, Greenville High tonight? Berea against Greenville High. What's funny is, like, where I lived, I don't know if you remember that whole situation. Oh, yeah. I was supposed to go to Berea, went to no. Berea for two days, and then I was like, I got to go to Greenville High. You know, all the boys were there, so it's exciting. I'm going to get to watch them play today. So my little brother, he's injured right now. Okay. Poor guy. He's 17. Great player. Did his, he plays for who? He's supposed to play for Berea. Did his ACL Oof. eight months ago, so he's close to his recovery. All right. So he'll be back here soon, so it's going to be interesting when he sees me talking to Greenville <laughs> to play his team. <laughs> I mean, you talk about your childhood, though. Like, you did grow up in Berea. And uh, I know when you first came on the pod a couple of years ago, we talked about your childhood. But for people that don't know, especially the Greenville Triumph community that maybe didn't know about your childhood, like, take me through kind of like your early childhood and like where you lived over in Berea, kind of what was it like back then? Right. Um, yeah, like you said, I grew up in Berea. Uh, my mother bought, brought me from Medellin, Colombia when I was three years old. My dad was kind of starting his whole life here in, in, in Berea, actually here in Greenville, but in Berea. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, I guess my mom was, I don't know the whole situation, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm guessing she was trying to get together with my dad again or whatever the case may be. But what she ended up doing was staying here and and that's kind of how my life began here. Uh, it's interesting because there's a call, there's a street called Lily Street, and there's a duplex, and it's right beside this house that has tons of cows, which is <laughs> interesting because there's a, it's a duplex house, like where it's like two, two, yeah, two, two houses, yeah, two houses put together. We're gonna talk about real estate later. You yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so I used to live on that at that house at that duplex, and then there's a trailer park in front of it. I also lived in that trailer park at one point. Dang. And then one night for one of my birthdays, I had all the buddies over. Now, this is farther down the line. My mom bought a house in that same area. And so I had all my buddies over. So every time now I cross, the, I go by the street because I'm, I'm with my dad right now. Those cows, one time I would jump over the, 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 the rails. <laughs> and when they sleep, you can push them over. I was maybe like, bro, I was, I had to be like 12 years old and I would push him over and then I would run. And one time my mom caught me doing it and I got in so much trouble for it. Dang. So, so every time I cross that street, it, if someone's in my car, I tell them that story. Just so, think about the cows. I just think about the cows, bro. I just push them over. It's so funny. Um, yeah. And bro, from there, like my life started in, in, in Berea. Um, wasn't easy. Obviously my mother wasn't making a lot of money, but sure. she was, she was working her butt off and trying to make ends meet and everything and so what was yeah. the club team back then like what was your first club team berea fusion all right <laughs> berea fusion and i'll never forget that because i had scored it was recreational soccer and I scored like i kid you not so they would put a sticker on this bucket this pepsi this huge pepsi bucket and for every goal you scored they would put a sticker on it with your initials and all that stuff the coach was coach frank i'll never forget <laughs> coach frank he had a. Uh, uh, he had a Jeep. He would drive like this little brown Jeep. I'll, I'll never forget it. Super nice guy. Super cool guy. And his son played on the team as well. So he would take me to practice and all that stuff. And he's like, listen, um, how it started is he saw me kicking a ball with this guy in this huge part of land. And he would always drive by there. And then one like day an stop. Lot, right? And I opened, yeah, just open lot. Just a ton of grass. You know, green with all grass. So, uh, he just saw me kicking it back and forth. It was with, with my, my dad's best friend. His name was Tito. And uh, I'll never forget, he stopped and was like, hey, like, we would love to have you on my, on my, on my recreational team. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I was like, I just wanted to play. So I get recruited, man. Yeah, I got recruited, bro. <laughs> and so next thing you know, I was playing for this team. It was green. had the cool little lines here on the corner. And I scored. I kid you not, that tournament scored like, it was like 100-something goals. <laughs> and so you would see the cup, the, the Pepsi bucket, and it was just full of just my stickers and like no other kids in the thing. And then from there on, that's kind of like I was 10 years old, exactly. And that's kind of how like my soccer started on being on a team because I always loved playing, but I never knew where I could find a team. Yeah. And from there on, we played a game, a game against um, Greenville Eagles. 
I will say, uh, rest in peace, Mr. Rene Lozano. Oh, yeah, man. He, uh, he was a big part of my childhood as well, especially when it comes to soccer of, of, of what I lived here in, in Greenville growing up and everything. And we played his team, and oh, my God, they were so good. They were they killed us. Like I'm used to playing every rec game, and we were used to winning every game by like a lot, and then this team killed us like 8 nothing. <laughs> I was traumatized, and that's where I met Miguel Teos. And that's kind of like that whole thing. That's where it all started. And uh, but either way, it was still very difficult because at the end of the day, my mom was working two jobs, trying to figure out who could take me to practice. We could we didn't have enough money for me to play for for teams. You know, it gets expensive to play on the club team and stuff. And so Definitely. the great thing is that I always had good people around, and 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 people would put their own money, like different families, different teammates. They would put their own money just to have me on their teams. Yeah. And so from there, I ended up going to to Greenville Eagles for, for a bit. And then from that team, I ended up going to, to GFC. Uh, Greenville Football Club. Greenville Football Club. Andrew Hislop was, was the owner of that and had Andrew as a coach as well. And then, then I ended up transferring again uh, to St. Giles. And that's where, I, where uh, Miguel and I played at St. Giles and, and a ton of guys and had a great team as well. Had Pierce Tormey. Obviously, yeah. Pierce was... Legend. Well, it, legend, legend of Greenville. And then those guys ended up merging together and they created a Carolina Elite Soccer Academy, which is CISA. And that's where that team came from and, and, and had some soccer wise. Those, I, I could say I had a really awesome childhood playing mm -hmm. soccer wise because all the teams we would have played for would make it to championships. We would win all the time. We had some great teams. and But at the backside of everything, I always knew that I was coming back home to, to, to a situation where. Things weren't easy, yeah. and they were very difficult. <clears throat> All of, I think one of the toughest things for me to always talk about is after CISA, I ended up going to Discovery Soccer Club. Now we're talking maybe U sixteen, U eighteen, yeah, U eighteen. And where was Discovery? Discovery's was in Rock Hill. Oh, yeah, That's yeah. where I played with Enzo Martino, Enzo Martinez, Alex Martinez. Yeah, super good. The Ralph Lundy son was on that team. Ralph Lundy. Um, we basically, what happened was like a lot of the best players from like teams from Georgia and maybe uh, North Carolina, they all started coming down. They all went to Discovery mm -hmm. and then they invited me to come be on the team as well. See if we had a chance. To, and we ended up becoming national champions and I got golden boot as well. And, and that was pretty, that was pretty, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. And, uh, but this is right before you think about going to college. Like, this is right before you're thinking about what you're going to do with college, all that good stuff. And, and like I said, at the end of the day, still, I would come home to, to, to not to a, I want to never say it was like a, a terrible home, but it was a home that we always knew that my mom was getting home late. A lot of times I was by myself or she was always trying to make things easy on me. She had bought me like a little Honda at one point mm -hmm. where I could be, I had a little black Honda. I'll never forget my little Honda. And she was just working her butt off to make everything happen for me. And, and I think that took a toll on her. And so one day I got back from playing I would always go to the indoors and all that stuff. Where yeah, I'll go to speedy train. and stuff. Speed, yeah, obviously speedy. I think everybody knows CIS. That was like the spot to go and play. And uh, yeah, she uh, she almost committed suicide. She overdosed. Mm -hmm. She was going through a really bad depression. I had no idea. She was trying to keep it to herself, trying to keep her son safe. And at that point, I remember when I came home and I saw her. Like literally, I thought she was dead. Mm -hmm. I, I remember my, 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 my first reaction was to uh, put her in the in a bathtub and, and put like cold water on her. That was kind of, I don't know where that came from. Maybe I don't even remember. Maybe in that moment, I, I looked it up to see what could help sure. her. Just come conscious. And just ice cold water. At one point, she was able to wake up and, and, and like, and so I was like, what is going on? What happened? She's like, no, I, I'm going through a depression. Like, this is, this is becoming too hard for me. I feel like all I do is work and work and work and, and I can't, I can't make things happen sure. for you. So she ended up moving back. She ended up moving back to Columbia, to Medellin. Uh, and then from that moment on, she stayed there for 10 years. And so I have to start my life here by myself. So what ended up happening is I ended up going on a trial to Spain, to Barcelona. <laughs> right? Everybody knows Barcelona. I was... This is a crazy story. I was super young. Hey, pull that mic a little closer. Please. Yeah, I was super young and... Uh, and uh, what was crazy is that I do this trial. Like, first, the way it happened was I was... And you've I, had an incredible youth career. Yeah, I mean, my youth career, I, I, I mean, can... I, uh, yeah. To, like, 
I mean, we're gonna get to this trial in a second, but I mean, we can even talk about like what you did at Greenville High, but like also yeah. Discovery. Like, I mean, you've even at, at the CISA days. Yeah, I was leading goal scorer like most tournaments. It was either between Enzo and I. Yeah, it was always the two that that would get the 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 Premier League Golden Boot or whatever you want. And Enzo, for people that don't know, is also he's still playing. I think. Yeah, he's still playing. Um, incredible soccer player. Played from Rock Hill. Yeah, the North were Western kinda, High School. We we're kind of like the yeah. 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 Everybody would always talk about who's better and who and all that. I remember I got to South Carolina, a, a guy that played with him at Northwestern, I think. I was like, Enzo's better. I was like, man, you crazy. Sebastian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was always the big thing. And it was interesting that we both ended up getting drafted to the same team yeah. in the MLS. Uh, but great guy, great friend of mine. We're, we're, we're great friends. We still talk to this day. And uh, and so, yeah, when, when this trial happened, I ended up, so I was doing, I was plumbing with my dad at Stax Original. Shout out to Nick and Michael. And Stax, Frank is still there. Stax is still there. I actually went to go get some breakfast uh, the other day. So taste is always great. So it's not the same though because my dad doesn't work there anymore. But um, he was their cook for 26 years. Like Dang. my dad was. And so it's always cool to come back. We were talking about that the other day actually. That at one point I was a dishwasher there. And it was the worst thing I've ever done in my life. And I think at that point I was like, I want to do a pro soccer play. So, um, yeah, we uh, I was we were fixing the, the 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 so we're doing like plumbing or like where you change the the gas tubes and all that. I needed like new tubes and mm -hmm. all that. Our oh, pipes, not tubes, but pipes. And uh, Anthony uh, Speedy, Anthony Solomon Speedy. Most of you guys know him as Speedy. Yeah, walks I didn't in, know his name. yeah. He walks in and is like, uh, do you want to be a do you really want to be a professional? I was like, of course. I was like, I'm, I'm sitting here with this jackrabbit trying to break all the tile. And, and, and this thing is like, my dad's yelling at me because I can't get it under control. I was like, dude, get me out of here. I was like, I'm not ready for this. And so he's like, "There's a, they're going to do like a combine at, 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 at a university. And they're bringing players from all over the world. And they want to look at and they want And since you're close by, everybody wants to look at you. They want to see what you're about. I had no idea who was going to be there. I just know I had to go and, and, and show up. So I ended up showing up and ended up see, it was, ended up being Steve Archibald. Mm -hmm. And so just so people have a reference, Steve Archibald played in Barcelona in 86 to 88, 1986 to 1988. And he was the goal scorer. He was the Pichichi, what mm -hmm. they call it. Played for Blackburn Rovers. Uh, he played for Surfer Alex Ferguson. Oh, man. So he, he was a legend. He was a legend. Absolute legend. He so if you watch Barca TV, he's one of the guys that's commentating. Random that he's here in, in, in the upstate and uh, so random. Yeah, and but when I got there, it was players from literally all over the world. It was players from all over the world. They looked at uh, some guys who were from like the Caribbean. Some guys were from like Europe. There was guys from all over. Though. It was crazy. And he told us that at the end of the combine, he would choose one player that he wanted to take overseas to, to, to be taken to like a second division club mm -hmm. in Spain to play in the second division. And then, so then we do this combine after a week and we played a whole bunch of games and I kept scoring and I kept dribbling and I kept, I had showed out kind of just did my thing. And uh, at the end of the thing, he's like, I, I want to bring uh, Sebastian Velasco over to Spain. And then all the paperwork started, all that good stuff, and that's when that happened. I ended up in Bar. I I show up to Barcelona, but never did I was told that maybe I'd be able to go on trial with Barcelona. And he, we're watching the game. I was we're watching we're watching the reserve team, and they were playing in the finals of the second division. And he was like, and he looks over to me. I'll never forget that moment. He looks over to me. He's like, he's like, I can see you playing there easily. It was like your technical ability. You can play there. You have the ability with the ball to play on that team. And I was just looking at him like, I was like, this guy's crazy. There's something wrong with him. He's like, all right. <laughs> if you say so. Sure, sign me up. Sure, sign me up. Yeah, yeah, just take me. And so next thing you know, he wasn't joking. We show up to La Masia. Huge building with the Barcelona symbol on it. Guards have shotguns holding the gates and all that good stuff. And I'm like, we really are here. They open the gates and boom, you drive your car in, they close them. And then you're in Barcelona's world, Barcelona Football Club's world. And that changed everything for me. That was, that changed everything for me. Because 
when they gave me my uniform to, to start practicing, yep. it literally was Barcelona. They have the Nike thing. And I'm like, I was just watching these guys on the weekend. It's crazy. Unreal. It was like 18 right now still, too, right? I saw 17 at that point. 17, 16, 17. About 16, about to be 17. And uh, they started me off with the U15s. So I was older than the guys there. And then they were like, okay. They saw me training like two days. And then they brought me up to the U. So then we played a game against the U17s, my same age group. And we tied 1-1 and I scored and the, I was playing with the U15s against the U17s, mm -hmm. and I scored the goal. I chipped the keeper with my right foot. Which never happened. Which never <laughs> happened. So I knew something was going my way. <laughs> never happened. Then from there, then they're moving me to the third team, which is called Juvenil A. So it goes first team, Reserva, Juvenil A, Juvenil B, Cadete A, Cadete B. So it's not by, by age, it's kind of like just by ranks. They moved me up to the Juvenil So you're like in the middle of the pack now. So now I'm two teams away from being from the first team. So it's like basically, let's say the third team. Yeah, yeah. And I'm seeing players that I had seen on TV, like young guys that, I mean, they had Mark Iniesta, they had uh, Rafinha, they had Jonathan Dos Santos, not Giovanni, Giovanni's brother, which is a funny story because I went to go get a, a little bit of tape for my ankle or I went to go do something in the trainer's room. And I see the kid and I'm like, Bro, has anyone told you you look just like Giovanni Dos Santos? His brother, man. <laughs> and, he, and he looked at me and was like, I'm actually his brother. And I was like, no way. And so then we kind of started like a cool little friendship there, right? A little conversation and stuff. And he kind of took me under his wing. And then we started playing. And everything was just going for me. It was crazy. Everything at that trial was going for me. The only time that it... The only, there's only one drill where I can say that I struggled when they were doing the one-touch possession. Mm -hmm. That... Since I was always training on my own, it's very difficult when you sure. just do one touch and you don't know how people yeah, yeah. play or people's like movements yeah. when 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 you're gonna play one touch. So that little part was difficult, but those guys were just boom, ping, knocking it, right. pinging it. But they're training with each other every day. But other than that, when we were free playing, dude, I'd school. I remember we played small sided, and I grew up playing small sided my whole life. You know, five beside Messi, Gavi, yeah. all these different places, destroying. And 5v5. And so then they, they told me, like, they, they told me, we want you to stay six months. But because you don't have any professional games under you, you, you I, one of the places I were playing was, was either Green High, at the time. I was at East High, <laughs> all these different, yeah, I was at CESA at the time. I had no professional experience, experience at all. And all these young guys, they've at least played some type of games. Because yeah, in that, in their world, you start playing those games so young. Exactly. That's exactly right. And these are guys that are making, even though they're young, they're making 250000 yeah. 200000 just being... And they're on the U18 team. And they're on the U18, yeah. yeah. They're, they're doing <laughs> well. Is, yeah. And so you think about that. And I was I was coming from, yeah, just playing playing regular soccer in Greenville. And, uh, <laughs> and so then they said six months, and then I was like, I can't stay because I don't have a U.S. passport. At that time, I still had my residence for the U.S. and mm -hmm. I had my Colombian passport. And so the visa situations where it got complicated now. I've always thought to myself, if Barcelona really wanted to make it happen, or, or they could at least they could at least push to figure out how to get me to stay there at least for six months. Yeah. But they wanted me to take care of it because they didn't want to invest their own money without knowing what to expect in yeah, six yeah. months from seeing me there. So then my agent got kind of mad. Well, Steve kind of got upset and was like, nah, you know what? I'm taking you to Manchester United in two weeks. And I was like, all right. Here we go again with the, here we go again with the crazy statements. <laughs> and so, unfortunately, I had to end up leave, uh, leaving. And then Espanol kind of found out that I was on trial with Barca. And so yeah. they wanted to see me. So then I had to do the whole visa process again. And that, that's kind of where it sucked because... Now it was kind of things that were out of my hands, mm -hmm. and it took me. The visa a thing is tough, dude. Um, yeah, it's it's Still very difficult. Day, it's yeah, hard, anytime man. you want to get a visa anywhere, it's very difficult. And so, my next visa, they gave it to me a year and a half after. So now I'm, now I'm turning almost nineteen, and this is kind of where I ended up going from. I go on this thing it's called the draft that they do. They have now those guys have players from. I'll never forget. There was like four. Four Asians, six Africans. No, this is, they call it oh. the draft at, in Espanol. Uh, they have guys from everywhere, everywhere. Italy. 
I didn't know they had a draft over there. No, they just call it the draft. Yeah. Espanol calls that, that that combine. They call it el draft. Yeah, that makes sense. And so I had, I still have newspapers about it and everything, and it was crazy. Like we played a tournament. We played against Bijan Real's youth group. We played against we played a four a fourteen tournament, dude, and, I, and and it went so well for me. And they ended up signing a sixteen year old. His name was Thievi Bifoma, and he ended up at one point he ended up going to first division and, and debuted and he was making bro he was killing Dang. making millions and all this crazy stuff yeah he, he did he did well for himself and they told me they're like listen you remind us of like a young Messi when Messi was coming through the ranks i'll never forget when that that with those coaches left footed too because i'm so left footed and that and at that time i was young so i was a lot faster a lot quicker i was yeah. dribbling around people um and they're like unfortunately you're 20 you're on you're about to be you're 19 you're about to be 20 years old like we need someone at 16 because the kid that signed was 16 years old. Yeah, yeah. And we need to be able to bring them. That's up how they develop them. And that's how they develop them. And that's how they're able to know what they're getting into. And so I ended up coming back. And that's where I ended up going to SMC. Mm -hmm. That was but you, you going over there in a way complicated you trying to get into like Clemson. Oh, it complicated everything for me everywhere. Yeah, it, it, because... At the end of the day, I had to sign for me to go over. I signed an agency contract, uh, mm -hmm. agent contract, and I had no idea. That's one thing I've always wished when I was younger that if I would have had people to guide me, yeah, yeah. in the sense of a little like, better guidance, it been knowing better. the rules. Like if my mom would have known the rules, she's like, "You can't sign a contract to this, yeah. or you can't do that," which is crazy because my mom over there trying to make yourself like a yeah. living and become what you dreamed of being exactly and now so, it complicates you trying to go to college. college yeah exactly <laughs> to get my education it's and all crazy. that stuff so yeah i i end up coming back and i'm kind of like in this little era of like where i'm stuck and i have no idea where i'm gonna go to college because i had already dropped out of school mm -hmm. i dropped out of high school i dropped out of east high high um and uh it became very difficult. I didn't know what to do until Miguel was like, why don't you come to our, our community college? And I was like, what community college? He's like, Spartanburg Method. I was like, where's that? He's like, it's obviously in Spartanburg, but it's like a couple yeah. of, it's, it's close. It's not, far. It's, it's not far from here. And I was like, you think coach would want to take me? And then he's had a conversation with the coach and then that's where it all changed. Uh, at that time it was Dan Keneally. Like a hundred goals later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you know what's crazy? In two weeks, they made it work out where I, because it, I was on trial and then I came back and I had nothing. I'm waiting on this whole thing with, with, with Espanol and then I ended up going there in the summer. And so as soon as I get back, there's like two weeks for the school to start. And somehow they figure out how to register me, get me in. And then they gave me some sort of scholarship. I have no idea how. And, and then they, they were like, we'll try to figure out a way to help you where you can get food and you can find a place where to stay and all that good stuff. And, that's where my career started there. I played for Dan Canelli one of the seasons, and then I played for Rich Weber the, the second mm -hmm. season. And it was, it Did was so much win, fun. like national championships or something? We won the regional championship. Right. And, and. Which is a big thing. For or me. actually, regional, we lost. No, we lost the regional final to go to nationals. Oh, okay. But we won the state one, and, and, and we, 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 we. we we broke some type of records and stuff. We had like a ton of wins for that, for the SMC. Yeah. I had some records for goals and assists because I had like 55 goals, 33 assists, and like and like <laughs> 60 something, 40 games or something. Yeah. I have no idea. And yeah, it, it was awesome though because it was so much fun. Like I enjoyed it. I was with all my friends I grew up as well. Like all the guys that I grew up playing with on, on, on Sundays, like when we were going to yeah. play around at Messi Cali or we were going to kick around at CIS. It was a ton of the same guys. Mm -hmm. So we all knew each other and we already knew what we were about. And, and and then unfortunately the league found out that I had gone on trial to Spain and then that's when it all became complicated again which is where why everything for me was always like up and down I was like on this huge high and then boom it'll come down because some weird complication that's out of my uh, reach I it's something I couldn't control yeah. and like I said I wish kind of that that's one of the biggest things I've always thought about was like the guidance that it comes with this with mm -hmm. this sport or like with contracts and like agents yeah. and all that stuff sometimes you have no idea definitely and uh yeah the league found out i went on trial signed a contract and i lost my eligibility so i couldn't play collegiate soccer anymore because at that point they you turn into a professional you lose all your amateur eligibility so i'm stuck and i'm looking at i'm on a roundabout i'm crying i have no idea what to do and 
and I had already had conversations because I was going to do two years SMC and then try to transfer over to uh, uh, Clemson University. Mm -hmm. And so Coach Noon and I were always in conversations. He watched me play, came and saw me play and all this good stuff. And then next thing you know, they find out I can't go to college anymore. And I'm just stuck. I have no idea what to do. Um, I ended up buying a flight December 17th, 2011 to, 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 to Columbia, to Medellin, to go see my mom and to go live there because mm -hmm. I was like, I have nothing here. I was like, what am I going to do? I don't want to work at, I don't want to work as a dishwasher. I don't want to do this. Or I want to go home. And, and to be honest, I had a, a thought process where if I went to Columbia, I was going to try to find out if I could go on trial and, yeah. and get on, on, get on a team or something. And I remember because it was so hard on me, what happened? I, I remember being in the office and crying and, this, and the next thing you know, uh, Coach Noonan shows up and he's like, I just made a call and I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, he's like, and he asked me the same question, do you want to be a professional? I said, of course. I was like, it's been my dream. I was like, maybe I haven't taken the, maybe I've tried every route, but my dream has always been the same, go to, to, to be on a professional soccer team. And he's like, I just, I just got a trial for you with Real Salt Lake. You're going from the seventh to the tenth to Casa Grande in Arizona. And so, Real Salt Lake is an MLS team. It's an MLS team. Yeah, it's uh, he did he he went out his own way. He made this call, and and he's the one that basically gave me the opportunity to to go and showcase myself in front of a professional club and in MLS. And so I ended up I ended up going on this on this trial and again, man, just doing what I love to do and just enjoying myself out there, score some goals, just <laughs> showed my ability. I mean, at that, to be honest, technically I was, I, I've been blessed. I've always, that's one thing I, I, I've always told my mom and my dad and I was just like, even the older I get now that I'm a lot older, my technical ability is just still there. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's like, I have this like relationship with the ball that's undescribable. Like it's like, I can understand the ball and it's, it's weird to be honest. <laughs> because I watch all my friends try it and then they can't do it. Or I watch guys that can do it, but they don't execute it in the same way. It's, it, it's, it's such a weird concept to think yeah. about. And uh, yeah, I was young and explosive and quick and fast and can dribble around people and make all this stuff happen. And, and you remember when we played high school, I was a striker. You guys were the ones that would play make for, for, yeah. for, for me to score goals. And now my role was completely different because in college soccer, or at, at, at Spartan Methodist, I was like kind of like a 10. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how that all started. And then obviously you see how short I am, they were like, you're not gonna be a, a striker. <laughs> nine, 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 nine. <laughs> all these guys are like six four, six. The center backs are six four. I'm like five six. But now you create opportunities. And so now I create opportunities for yeah. And now I create opportunities for other players for strikers. And so, um, yeah, it, I go on this trial. Things go great. Who was my the coach then? Jason Christ. Was he the coach at draft league? He he. So I would say it was Miles Joseph, C.J. Brown, and Jeff Kassar because they were the three that saw me at the actual trial. Oh, got it. And coach was over in, in in Europe doing some licenses and stuff, and uh, and looking for players that he wanted to bring to the Real Salt Lake team. On top of that, this Real Salt Lake team is the first team that, that first team ever to make it to Concacaf Champions Finals from the MLS because usually all the Mexican teams are using Mexican, Mexican, yeah. Mexican teams that that win it and uh, not yeah, anymore though. And yeah, not anymore. And so yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. They had just won a, a national. Uh, they had won the MLS Cup, mm -hmm. two thousand nine. So they were. It was a sick team. It was a very good team. And uh, they're like, I go back to Columbia, and I didn't know what was gonna happen because they they told me like they're like we're gonna. They started talking about we want to put you in the Disco discovery draft and discovery draft like this whole idea where. You, they basically said no one can touch this player because we discovered him, but we have to wait to see if we want to sign him or not and all this crazy. And then next thing you know, I get a, I get a text from Miles Joseph. He's the assistant coach right now at Charlotte United. And he's like, you might want to pay attention to the Super Draft. And I was like, why? And he was like, he was like just pay attention to it. He was like, just, just watch it. I'm like, all right. And so it's January 16th, and I'm sitting there with my family and just watching it. In Columbia. In Columbia. I'm imagining and I knew this was the fine line between me making it pro and not making it. 
that it literally there's no other there's nothing else I could think in that moment where I was like, you would have made it but keep going <laughs> and so I, I I thought to myself all right let's see and, and what I realized about Colombia bro Colombia the opportunities are very hard to come by yeah because Colombia is a place where it's just so big on just ego and like you have to know somebody to like get somewhere and stuff and and and, and I've realized that because I've gone out there and, and seen what it's like with the professional football world you have to pay agents out there. Mm. Imagine, like, it's not like agents trying to get money from a club. You have to pay them to try to do something for you. And I didn't know anyone there. And uh, I'm watching this draft. And I, but I can't watch that actual ceremony. I can only watch the list that they bring out each time someone gets drafted. <laughs> and it gets to pick 35. And I knew there was only four more picks left from each team. Not, not from each team, but it was a lot of that. Four picks left total. Every team had already chosen two. And so then they're like, I get a message from someone and it goes, congratulations, we always knew you were going to make it. And then my thing started blowing up and I go to refresh the page and literally it says, Real Salt Lake, Juan Velasquez. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny is that on the ceremony thing, since I couldn't watch it, but it, it, even on the thing, you can click on what, it, what they put about you. Yeah. And it was no picture, no weight, no height, no background, no address, just nothing. And then all it says is Sparber Methodist. <laughs> hey, man, but what's it? So that was like, at the time, the first, you were the first player from a school like Sparber Methodist to get drafted. It's second, second player. So I was the second player to ever get drafted from a junior college. Yeah. There's only been two players to do it from junior college still. Cause I'm trying to look it up and still to get drafted in a super draft straight to MLS. I'm the second player to ever do it, and still that's apparently that's still. He has some incredible years in Real Salt Lake. I, I, you know, it's crazy because a lot of people, a lot of fans used to like love love watching my, me play. And what's interesting, <laughs> you had a rat tail, man. Is, dude, I had the rat tail on top of that. <laughs> I had like this huge charisma about it. I had all this crazy hair. And the thing is, I played as an eight, which was an interesting position. Yeah, I've never played in my you life. Played me, right? No, we played a diamond formation. And so I remember Saudio Spindle up top, Javi, myself, Ned Gravaboy, or if I wasn't starting, it was Will Johnson, Kyle Beckerman in the diamond formation, and then our four our yeah. four defenders and Nick Romano in the goal. And you had Matt Borchers, Olave, Tony, uh, Chris Winger, Tony Belcher. Incredible. He's stacked. Yeah, y'all were stacked. And uh, and so the reason was the three guys up top they were always attacking stuff, but we would knock it like we we're very like Barcelona like we always had the ball, and uh, but my job was when we lost the ball in transition or whatever I had to go on my horse and go ahead and tackle somebody go win the ball and then knock it again, and so it was interesting because I never did that. That wasn't your game. That was never my game. <laughs> I had to learn that. I had to learn that, but. I was so eager to play that I was willing to do whatever I, it took to get me on the field. And that sat me down. They were like, listen, we know you're a playmaker. We've watched you play. You're a playmaker. But we we can't get you on the pitch being a playmaker. We, Javi Morales, our best player. He's plays, nasty. Yeah, he's unbelievable. He's now the assistant coach at Inter Miami with Messi and Suarez and Sergio Ske and Jordan. It's crazy. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> just nuts. I mean, the thing about how the MLS has even changed from then to now. Oh, it's changed, changed even more. Like, completely changed. And you so, play with some of those big guys, though. Yeah, yeah. Sure. so then next thing you know, I, I the, the 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 thing about my MLS career that I till this day I still think about it, dude. And it's like there's a lot of regret and a lot of things that happened to me throughout my career because I see guys that still play that I played with and they're you still in the league, league, and I'm like, no, no, I wouldn't say that I know that I'm better at them because I do know I'm better at them, but it's kind of like. I know how well they're doing for their families and how well, yeah. like, like financially, how, how well they're So I think about that. I'm like, I could be in a position where I could be making mm -hmm. a lot more money and all that stuff. And like, you know, we were talking about real estate earlier before we started the show. And, and so all those things like come into play because it wasn't now, it didn't become just soccer. It become like a responsibility because now I have kids. I have my mother to take care of. I have a whole, all these different things I have to take care of. And so that's probably the thing about it. And, and maybe for people I don't know my story. So in 2014, uh, I got arrested for a DUI and I got in a lot of trouble for it. I was a kid that was super known because of my rat tail around the league. Mm -hmm. 
the whole league would do always promotions for me because of my hair and all that. And, and, and I was one of the only young guys that was, I mean, on that Real Salt Lake team, I was one of the young guys that was playing. Yeah, they yeah. have young guys on the team. They have tons of veterans. Yeah, critical part of that. You Crit were a critical part yeah. of the team. Yeah. We went to an MLS Cup final 2013. And we went to actually two finals. We went to the U.S. Open Cup final. We lost that one at home against D.C. United. And then we 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 uh, and then we went to the MLS Cup final and we lost that one in PKs. Mm -hmm. And I took the there was a decisive PK where if I would have scored it, we would have won. And I had a bad trauma through that because of that situation. It, it it was terrible because I thought like the game kind of like you took it on yourself. I took it on myself and I felt like the game like betrayed me. It was so interesting. Like I was like, why would the game do that to me? Like I'm one of the young guys. I was like, I'm the one that stepped up on a veteran team and all this and that. And it just, it, it, it became, became a very difficult situation. And then on top of that, I had some traumatic events when I was young. And PKs are hard as shit, dude. Yeah. And not only that, bro, it's like, I remember watching that. Like, I'm 20, I'm 21 years old. Like, so I'm, I'm, I'm 21 years old. I had, I was my second year and I'm, but I'm confident. That's the thing about me. I've never been scared of mm -hmm. Anything like that. Like, even when I debuted it, I debuted it when I was 20 years old. Debuted against LA Galaxy, against David Beckham, Landon Donovan in his top moment, Edson Buttle, Robbie Keane, uh, Zarbus, Juninho. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they had a stacked team. They had won five championships, and I'm sitting here starting against them. Then I get man of the match because the first play, we were down 1 0, and I do this like dribble through Santa, and I send a, a cross through the middle, and it deflects off one defender, goes in. I remember that. And I got men of the match. So, so many ups and ups and downs that, that were happening. And then it, 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 it hit my rock bottom is when I got it, when I missed that PK. And then the person that, when I was young, I had a lot of traumatic events that happened. Mm -hmm. Somebody did something to me as a kid and that person was murdered back at home. Mm -hmm. And that hit me hard, that, that was difficult. And so I went on this binge drinking like terrible, like I, I went through like this bad depression and I got arrested. And that's kind of when I hit rock bottom. I hit rock bottom at that point because I was all over the news, mm -hmm. everyone back at home, like people like would talk about it. And it was just, it was kind of like embarrassing for me and yeah. my family. And to you, you know, I think you as the individual take it way harder than like what the community even thought about it. Exactly, it, it becomes very different. Yeah. Like, like people don't understand you that. You think it's piling on you know what I mean? Yeah. You're just like, you feel like you're in a shell. And yeah. Like, um, and it's like, like a lot of people that loved you were like, you know, we had heard about it, but like, we were like, oh, Sebastian's a bad player. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, it's interesting. It's interesting how, how that, like when you think about it, once you get yeah. out of it, like how dark that, that place is where people can go and like, it's yeah. like a cage where you can't get out of your thoughts, your emotions, like everything you go through, like everything very negative. And, yeah. And, and that's what maybe some people don't understand when people go through like these difficult situations. Like you, you see, especially now, more so that a lot of people, like you see a lot of suicides and stuff like that. And you know, people are like, ah, oh, why would he kill himself and stuff like that? People don't understand what that person's feeling in that yeah. moment and how their emotions can just they're take control. In their they're feelings. trapped in their feelings and in their head that, that yeah. they feel like you can't get out of. And so I think I went through that for, for, for a long time and then Thankfully, the league was amazing. They, they they took me to rehab, and I got out of that for like it was like two months where I went to rehab, and uh, it, I was able to clean myself up, and and then I ended up going to New York City, and so I got another chance. Ended up going to New York City, and that was unbelievable. Another yeah. incredible team. Yeah, I got incredible to, players. Like, yeah, crazy. yeah, it was unreal because like when when I already knew the players they had. And then next thing you know, I got a call and they're like, oh, we're trading you tomorrow to New York City. And I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. I was like, isn't that where David Villa is? Andrea Pirlo, Lampard. <laughs> On top of that, our preseason was at Manchester City's facilities. Like we were in England, we we're in Manchester. And I got to like go out there and experience what that was like. It was unbelievable. Like one day we, 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 we did my birthday celebration uh, we, did, we did my birthday celebration as a team. We, we, we went out, had a good time. And the table that was right beside me, the person that had the the, 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 the VIP table that was right beside me, was Mario Balotelli's 
and he's sitting there chilling, and I was like, "What in the world? What is this? Like, <laughs> unreal!" And like, and and then like players were there from like Manchester, like like from Manchester United, and I got to meet a couple of the youth guys that were from Manchester United. It, it, it was so it's just a different world. Yeah. Just stuff you can't explain. And uh, yeah, it was it was awesome. Got to play a ton of games and stuff, and. You and Unfortunately, Devin, became good friends. Oh, we became huge friends. Like I got to spend time with his dad, his kids, his his wife, his family. Um, Is he still playing? I think he might still be playing. No, he so he retired like two years ago. He has he has some academies. They're called the DB Sevens Academy. He has them all over the world, actually. Nice. And he and he also works with a representation company with his his agent Victor. And yeah, he has like a lot of stuff going on. He's done what I think he. The last time I talked yeah, to him, yeah, he was the leading goal scorer for Spain, like the Spanish national team. Yeah, when they won a World Cup, and yeah. he holds the record for most goals for Spain and yeah. a World Cup. Unbelievable guy, dude. This guy was one of the most humble people I'd ever met, and he Incredible worked goal and, scorer, he, and, he, and he worked his he worked Smile. his balls off, dude. It was unbelievable to see his work. His work rate was unreal. He was thirty five, and he was just working his tail off all the time. Mm-hmm. It is that's where where I, I find it interesting because. You know, you, you, you play with different egos all the time. And you have guys that have never won anything and they think like they're, they're, they're like the greatest thing on this earth. And then I played against, I played literally with three of the max, like they've won the maximum as a soccer player. World Cup, Champions League when they won, with, when they won 3-0 against Manchester United. Leading goal scorer, historic goal scorer. The most goals in, Bi- in Valencia are Sporting Gijon. And you're just like, why, how's this guy so humble? He could literally just be like, I want this one, this and that. So I, I've always found that interesting. Nice. Yeah, I've always found that interesting. <laughs> Those guys are the best, dude. Yeah, best of the best. They're, 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 they go down as legends of the game. And uh, and every time I see them on TV or I see them do something, I'm like, dude. Like, That's my guy. <laughs> I put that dude's number on my WhatsApp, bro. Like, like, literally on my WhatsApp app, their number's there, bro. <laughs> so it's cool, man. It's cool. And so... Unfortunately, what happened with that was, so when I had gotten my first DUI, I already had, no, I got another one here, actually in Grip, no one knew about. Mm-hmm. And I held off on that. I paid the best lawyer. Um, and I, that, that held off for two years. Like the whole case was held off yeah. for two years. And then it ended up being something completely different. It changed to something different. But that case, when I went to, fly to, to, to Canada, they have to do a background check for the players that are going to Canada mm-hmm. for some reason. And then they're like, why do you have a second case of this? And I was like, oh, it's a case that happened in 2014. Like, it just hasn't been closed. It hasn't been finished. But there's no problem with it. Everything's okay, yada, yada, yada. And then back in, back in, back in, trying to, back in that same situation where I just, at that point, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't do anything about it. And, and so then they actually were going to sign me again, which was interesting because they called me after. And they're like, listen, they sent me back to rehab to make sure I was okay. But at that time, I was perfectly fine because I had already gone through the first rehab. And I went to the second rehab and I just told them, I was like, listen, listen, I don't want any more problems with this. I was like, I'm just, I just want to be, I'll be sober for however long I feel like I need to. And, 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 that. and so then they're like, okay, well, they wanted to sign me again. If coach was gonna stay, but then coach they ended up getting rid of coach, and and so and David Viga actually went and spoke to the club. Was like, keep him for two more years, give him a chance. Like the kid, the kid gives everything. He has the ability at it. And then what ended up happening? They got rid of Jason Christ, and so then all the players that he had brought in. That was the same kind of, coach you had at Real Salt Lake. That's the same coach I had at Real Salt Lake. And so then I have to start a. That's when I ended up. Crazy. The next team I got, different so I, path, yeah. yeah, different path, completely different path. And the problem is, I didn't have an agent at that point, mm-hmm. so I had no idea how I was going to get back into like the the soccer world or like sustain the MLS, which is another thing. I wish I had had better guidance because if I would have had an, a proper agent at that time, I think a proper agent would be like, all right, here we're going to talk to some other clubs. We'll get you staying in the MLS. Or you'll stay in the MLS, and you'll you'll be you'll be all right. You'll be all right. It's all going to work out. But I didn't have an agent. So I ended up hosting a video. A lot of times I post videos on And a coach hits me up and is like, hey, would you like to play for my team and this and that? And I was so scared. I wasn't going to have a team that I just ended up going to that team. And I ended up going to OKC Roger in the NSL. Mm-hmm. 
And then after that, uh, I went to go visit my son because Armani at that point was born. And and so on September 14th, September 14th, 2015, I had made a decision after the whole New York City thing that I was going to stay sober. So I stayed sober for seven years after that. Mm -hmm. So now I'm on this clean path of soccer. And, uh, and which was awesome because like at that point, then I, I go visit my son in Salt Lake and I get a call from like the GM, which was Elliot Fall. And he's like, listen, <clears throat> we have a second division team here. Oh yeah. You played for them a long time. I played for them for two years. Yeah. And so they're like, we have a second division here, team here. Like we're, we struggle. We haven't made the playoffs. Would you be willing to come? And if you do things well, never know. We can probably bring you back to the first team. And so that little bulb in my head. Next thing you know, I was on a flight back to Salt Lake. They gave me my apartment. I knew I was gonna be with my son every day. I was like, this is the perfect situation. And bro, it was different, different level. I started playing probably my best football at that moment. First seven games, I had like seven goals and like six assists or something. I was gonna be, uh, I was best 11 that season, best 11, had, I ended up with 10 goals, seven assists. Um, and then the second season again, killed it again, had nine goals, six assists. And, but I'm waiting for this opportunity to go back to the MLS. And yeah. for some odd reason, it wasn't given to me. And so, top USL teams, which, because that was the USL, the USL championship, yeah. were offering me contracts of like 140 grand, 130 grand. Something unheard of that they don't pay in that league. Yeah, yeah. Because I was a part of the uh, players union at one point, and there was only one, there was only, a 5% that was making over 60 grand. Yeah. Which or people, 50 yeah. grand. People don't know. Like, it's it's hard to make good money. In oh, place. it's very difficult. And, mm, second division, very difficult for you to make decent money. I, I don't know what people would... But, yeah, it's hard to Definitely. make actual life-changing money, put it like that. Yeah. And I was getting offered these crazy contracts from all the teams because I was... And I would say now I'm the best attacking midfielder there was. And uh, <clears throat> next thing you know, Korea came in the way. Korea offered me this crazy yeah. contract, and I knew it was something I had worked hard for. And and now I was seeing the upside, not just to, because to be honest, if I would have went back to MLS, it would have been great because people would have knew I was in the MLS. But I, they they weren't gonna offer me it. They would offer me another minimum. Be like, oh, you're back in the league. All right, you're a yeah. domestic player. Boom, take take a minimum and be happy. And Korea offered me this crazy contract, a life changing contract and that's when my career started in Korea. Uh you played all over it, dude. Yeah. It was pretty cool because that that place was unreal. It was so much fun. The only thing was my 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 lady during the time that I, I was with during that time, she had a we had Sophia on the way. We were gonna mm -hmm. have a baby. And she was gonna have to travel back to uh to the States because they didn't give she didn't have like a visa to stay stay yeah. there and, and, and all that. And I didn't want her to have the baby by herself. So you left Korea and came so back. So I left Korea and I came back. And I, I, I worked out a, a I worked out a decent pay to get out. And that way they wouldn't have to pay me all the money that they were they were gonna owe me, but they paid me like a like like eighty percent of it. Yeah. And then I can't ended up coming back. And so that's how I ended up in El Paso. And you had a great few seasons there. And then, yeah, we went to a couple finals in El Paso. I feel like they loved you in El Paso. Oh, it was awesome, dude. El Paso was, was, was awesome. I love El Paso. But I didn't go to Israel or somewhere like that. So I ended up having, like, <laughs> thankfully I had some good seasons at El Paso. And then a first division club. So what happened was I, I had 20, in 2019, yeah, like 2020 and 2019, I had this... Great season with El Paso where we went all the way to the finals. It's the mm -hmm. first year. The club of my of my life, Atletico Nacional. Oh yeah. Green yeah. and white. Every Colombian, a lot of like Colombian. The triumph, man. <laughs> yeah, green and white, and they uh they ended up becoming interested interested in seeing me on trial. And oh my god, dude. It it was I surreal. That. It was surreal. Like everyone around me. Columbia, everyone in Greece, everyone that knew me and knew I was on trial was like, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened to him if he makes it. Because it's it's a club that's played that's won Copa Libertadores twice, 18 championships, 17 championships in Colombia, top team in Colombia. Top, top team. 
and proper salaries I'm talking about. These guys make bank. They make money. And uh, I go on this trial. And it's my dad's favorite team. My dad loves Nacional with his heart. All you boys do, man. Struck yeah. All of them, man. Yeah, exactly. All the boys that you, you've hung out with, the Colombian boys, that, that they love Strepolos. It, um, it, was, it was unreal. And I go on this trial, and I ball out. Ball out. First day we played, I'll, I'll never forget, first day we played 11 v 11. I was basically on the second team. Like, the guys that don't start against the guys that start. I had, I had two goals. I had two goals and I had two assists. We won 4-2. So then they're like, the thing is, in Colombia, players are known, left-footed players are very loved. Mm -hmm. Like, you have the Jamel Rodriguez, Juan Fernando Quintero, uh, I think his name is Daniel Ruiz. Uh, tons of left-footed players are left-footed players in Colombia is like the biggest thing. Yeah, left-footed players in general are just like different. different. In some way, yeah, something about it is just different. And so that they were like, "Who's this left-footed kid?" Second, but they're like, "Okay, it's just first day." So second day, same thing. Play eleven v eleven. I had a goal, eh. and then they were doing like a coaches combine while all this is going on, and then everyone started asking, "Yo, who is that left-footed kid?" Because at the end of the day, like, like I knew when it comes to ability, I know what I, I'm about. Like I know my ability. Like if I if I put my technical ability against some of the best, ones, I, I I I don't, I don't. You I have a lot of confidence. Yeah. I don't question. The physical aspects a little bit different because some guys are taller. A lot, their body's a lot bigger. Like straight line faster. A yeah. straight line faster. So, and so that's where for me that's where it becomes. And then understanding the game, I don't question it either. I understand the game. And so I was I was like, all right, I'm going to come into the biggest club in Colombia, and I'll be able to tell if I'm up for this level. I'll, I'll be honest with myself. I don't need anyone to tell me, all right, you're not good enough. Bro, I was like, I should stay here. So I caught the coach walking to his car after day three. And I told him, I was like, listen, I was like, I know I come from America. I know, like, here in Colombia, they have a different view of what soccer is like, but everything's changed. I was like, everything's changed. Football in America is a different level. And not any player can just go to America and just kill it just like that. It's not yeah. that. It's not what people think. This isn't, this isn't 20 years ago. And I was like, if you give me a chance on this team of Nacional, and what you, I know what you've seen at training, I was like, I'll be the hardest working player you'll, you'll, you'll have. And so I guess for some reason that, Maybe that gave him like a little seed or something. It, it planted a little seed where it started growing. So day four, which is Thursday, I'm coming into training and his head pops out the office on the, off the second floor. And he's like, he called me Gringo. That's <laughs> me, man. <laughs> <laughs> he called me Gringo. It was so funny, bro. He was such a funny dude. And, and it's actually Carlos Osorio. And this is a coach. He was a coach of Mexico a couple of years ago. And, Huge coach, mm -hmm. known, very well known. He coached a Red Bull at one point here. Yeah, I was about to say, I know him. Yeah, yeah. And he, he's like, listen, it, he didn't say it like that. He said it more vulgar, but he was like, I want you to stay in Colombia. And he was like, be careful because I know what the life is like here and I know what the girls are like here. So, so your ass better be good is what basically he told me. And I was like, all right, all right. And so I knew at that point some green light was given. And so then negotiations started. I knew negotiations were going to take a couple of days while I'm doing this trial. And then like two days after, right, because they're, they, my agent had already told me they want you, but, but they're offering you $1,000 a month. And I was like, $1,000? I was like, I'm not playing for $1,000. That's crazy. That's 12 grand in yeah. one year, no that way. Sense. And so I think they were trying to lowball me because they knew that I was, I love the team. And then on top of that, I was coming from a second division. And I was like, I'm not playing for $1,000. That's crazy, I'd rather go back home. And then, and then, Salary started slowly going up more and more and more and more. And then two days after, I ripped my hamstring. Oof. Second degree hamstring uh, tear. Tear. Damn. Oh, my God. That's probably been one of the worst injuries and in, in sense of pain at one at, at, in a moment. Mm -hmm. At least that I've had. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, bro. I try to dribble between two guys. I pushed it in between them. And then I try to split them both and get through. But it was two center backs and strong guys. <laughs> and so, like, I'm guessing from the power that I try to exert to get yep. through them, my hamstring didn't resist. Oh, Boom! Yeah. Dude, it sounds sometimes like a damn gunshot. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. It was, was I like was crying, bro. I was crying literally from the pain. I couldn't move. They had the three of the players had to pick me up. And I had already felt like I was a part of the team because they started laughing. They started giving me they gave me a nickname and everything. And yeah, it was it was it was sad. So what they ended up doing, they ended up paying my recovery because they were seeing trying to see if they can get me recovered by January third. That's the second degree. I, I got hurt like it was like December nineteenth. I, I won't forget that day. Yeah, yeah. And January th- I wasn't gonna be ready. Yeah. It was gonna take like it was gonna take like a month and a half for me to get back. Mm-hmm. And so that tournament there starts super early. That's the thing. Their their break is only a week and a half, and then they're back in the preseason for two weeks, and then they play again. And so I I, I couldn't make it for the tournament. Have they reached out to you any since then? No, nah, because I'm to the coaches and uh, they, sometimes I'll get a text and like, hey, would you be interested in coming back for a trial? But it's not always like like certain. Yeah, yeah. And so I was super excited about that because I know if I would have played on that team and I would have went to that team, my career would have changed drastically. Like, you go and play Atletico Nacional, then that's when the opportunities go to go to Europe. Even if you're 29 years old, 30 years yeah, old. Yeah. You got a chance to go to Europe. You get a chance to... Get a bigger contract. Get a MLS. huge contract. Go go to MLS after that. Like it, it, it was a, it was a very interesting moment in my life. And so unfortunately, I, I was I had all I had also had a huge huge contract mm-hmm. offer from from El Paso, but I had I had held that off until I figured out what was going to happen with Nacional. It was it was just inevitable. I mean, Nacional is Nacional, and. Uh, and unfortunately, it didn't work out. So then I ended up going to Miami. Well, over there to, 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 to the bad buddy vibes in Miami. <laughs> and that was unreal because I didn't know what to expect, but I was balling out. Even though my and my team didn't, like, we, as a team, we didn't do great. But my football was, it was decent at that point. It was, it was at a good place at that point. I guess maybe I was motivated because, like, maybe I was thinking maybe I'd have another tra- chance yeah. at Nacional. I don't know what it is. And I think, you know, that's what I've realized. That a lot of my career has to do with, with what's motivating me. Mm-hmm. Like, if I have the sense that I'm going back to MLS, then I'm, I'm going crazy. If I have a chance to think I'm going back after to go overseas, then I'm going crazy about it. And, yeah, I had a great – it was COVID season, so it was like a half season. Had this great half season through the whole COVID thing, and then next thing you know, an Israel team from first division is like, "We want to buy. Well, we want to bring you." And uh, they ended up bringing me. They gave me a very good contract as well, another life changing contract. And then, yep, that's when I ended up playing in Israel. Hey, what's um Israel is probably crazy, by the way. You've told me some stories about that. With uh, fast forward till kind of now. Yeah. Like, I bet a big motivation has to be like you're back around your family, you're back around people that watched you grow up. Like the support is the support of the community is probably bigger than ever for you right now. From like not playing here and you just like get here and everybody's yeah. like, let's go. <laughs> yeah. I think as far as support, I think the biggest I've ever had is now. It's been unbelievable. Unbelievable. Not even when I was in MLS. Like, obviously, in MLS, people know me because of my hair. Yeah. yeah. But people here personally know me. And so, uh, yeah. What was the um, what was the conversation like when you started thinking about coming back? So, as soon as my contract ended with uh, with uh, Indy 11, I was in Indiana, in Indianapolis. Um, you know, I love playing in the USL. I- I've loved playing in the yeah. USL. But I always looked at my USL career as being like a a stage to take me somewhere else. It was always, that was always on my mind. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I've always been like that. I always want to like, for, go for bigger and better things. And, and, uh, and USL has become such a, such incredible league because so many players are jumping from here and you're seeing young guys getting sold sure. to MLS teams and young guys getting sold to Europe and a whole bunch of crazy things are happening now for the uh, USL which has changed throughout the years that I've played in this league. But now I'm in a point in my career where I was like, where am I going to go now? Yeah, yeah. I actually had a coach in there like three weeks ago. I was like, from Israel. He's like, hey, I want to bring you to Israel. You want to come to Israel? And I was like, I, I do not. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Um, and so when my contract is like, it gets lonely sometimes traveling so much. Yeah. 
It gets lonely. Even all and, over the world. Exactly. And I've and and now I'm 33. Um, even though I don't look like I'm 33. I mean, you played 12 years of professional soccer. Yeah. Like, I 12 years in any professional sport is like a freaking. That's a decent career. Ass career. Yeah, that's not a bad career. I mean, NFL so, players, the average career is like three years. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a lot of professional athletes don't play more than like a couple years. Yeah, Playing exactly. 12 years is crazy. And so I was like, what do I want to do? Do I want to go travel again somewhere? There was a couple teams that wanted me in California, a couple teams that wanted me in South Florida, and a little bit of, of I, I got like a Peru offer and a Guatemala offer, and I was like, dude, I'm not going through this again. Like, my parents are getting older. Like, I, I'm not with my kids anymore, so like, I'm not with the mother of my, of my, of my children, which I, I miss my, 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 my son and my daughter every day. So I was like, what do I want? And literally the thought process was like, you know what, I'm gonna go take a, take a little vacation in Greenville. I came here for like three weeks. You came to my Christmas party. Man. Exactly, I came to the Christmas party and I was like, I was like, if, if I enjoy my three weeks there, then I, I, I wanna come back home. Got here, three weeks was so much fun. You see the boys, you go out to eat. Have, uh, have you go and you go and grab a drink? You go in and, and hang out with your mom. You go and hang out with my dad. Like hang out with my dad, and I was like, just imagine just doing it on the daily. Mm -hmm. I was like, this would be perfect. And then on top of that, being paid to play with professional in my my hometown where I grew up, I was like, there's no other way to do it. There's yeah. just it just it just blinks. So I hit up Ryan, Ryan Mackey. I think I'm saying his last name right. He played at Furman. He's a, he was a football guy, and he, he, he loves soccer now, and he became our fitness coach. Oh, oh, he's the fitness coach of the team. Nice. And he trained me when I was little, when I was trying to get ready for my Spain tryouts. And he, uh, he, he worked always on my physical aspects, so I had a meeting with him. And I was like, listen, I know you're this and that. You're, you're working with the team. I, I, I would love to see what you think if I was interested to come and play here. And we've always tried to make it happen many times, but it would always be halfway, like June, July, and mm -hmm. because I was coming back from some some different country. Yeah. And and so now is the perfect time. Now it's off season for you their team the and their team, them, yeah. and so I can start the season perfectly with them. And you got a full off season. He made a he made a call, man. We went and grabbed some sushi downtown. He made one call, Coach Rick. Hey, I have Sebastian Velasquez with me. He's interested in coming. He would love to have a conversation with you. Boom. Coach Rick was like, give me one hour, let's meet at a coffee shop. <laughs> and then at first, what's funny is that I hope, I hope one day you bring Chris, uh, Co Coach Rick on here. He is so funny. And he, the first thing he said, he's like, you know what? I don't think we can make this happen. And I'm like, <laughs> what'd you like Wait, why'd you make me come to like And he was like, I just don't know if we can pay you. I don't know if we can afford you. I don't know all this and that. I was like, listen, right now, I just want to make this happen. I was like, don't worry about, let's not worry so much about the salary. Let's work, let's work and see if it works out for us on 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 the long term, on me playing on the team, on me helping the team, on me being a, play, uh, a leader on the team, on me being a part of the community, me bringing fans in, me selling jerseys. Let's look at it in every angle. And we sat down and we just started chopping it up, talking, bro, for like three hours. Then we met again at another sushi spot, another three hours. Then we met at a coffee shop downtown. Another three hours. And then at one point, it just it just became like, we knew at that point that we both wanted to make it happen. And so we started our negotiations and everything. And, and dude, I was, I was, I'm so excited to be back. Like, you know, it was raining. Uh, I've been like, you know, people have been buying jerseys. People have my last name on They sold out your jersey. Man. They sold out. Yeah, they, they, they got apparently like 15 or 20 jerseys just to like already made. To see if people would buy them, and then they already sold out, and so now they have to buy another batch. <laughs> and so, and so, I had told them I was like, I don't think you guys know how much the community supports me here. I don't think you guys can even imagine what it's like. And they weren't sure because at the end of the day, I've never had someone. Yeah, like, and you've been gone for twelve years. I've been gone for so long, and I was like, I was like, trust me, this will be different than any year that you guys. I told them I was like, it'll be different for you. And one big thing I talked to him about was also the Spanish community because I went to a game and there wasn't many Latinos yeah. there, and I was like, "Dude, I grew up in and the Spanish, the Spanish community." Yeah, I was like, I, 
I've worked roofing with some guys. I've done some carpet work with a couple of those guys. Yeah. I know everybody in the Spanish community. And, and you know, this weekend, you know, it's funny. I always say that in South Carolina, when it rains, people don't go outside. And this weekend, bro, we had our first game of the season. It rained. And I was like, no, man, like, please. The day, like, like, the day morning. The day before and the morning go yeah. until like one. And then next thing you know, bro, the stadium had a huge crowd, like great crowd, bro. It's huge atmosphere. Tons of people had my jersey. Tons of the people that came were a ton of my friends, like literally my friends. Yeah. And it was, it was awesome, bro. And I was just like, wow, I can't imagine like on a Sunday night, next game at home, dude, this place is going to be rocking. And I think a lot of the guys, even Miguel didn't even go like, but some of my better Jonathan didn't. I was at that home. You guys were all out of town. <laughs> and I was like, all these guys were like, at weddings and stuff, so I can't imagine when the when the whole like oh, yeah, everyone big comes in. All those boys yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, I, I people's support has been unreal. Like people have bought tickets. Like because that's like? A, that's the biggest thing. I was like, people better not ask me for tickets because they told me from the start we're not giving away tickets. <laughs> you only get two tickets, and I was like, all right, I only get two tickets. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, even people like I had this guy doing some work at a house next to me yesterday. He's like, oh, Sebastian is back. You know what I mean? I met with this guy in real estate this morning. He's like, oh, we got Sebastian now. It's just like, I feel proud. I'm like, yeah, man, I miss Sebastian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a great. And what people don't realize that grief was such a, uh, it's returning to a big, it, it seems to me at least, it's, from when I have left, Yeah. it's like a huge city now. Like, I, I look at it as like a big city. And then at the end of the day, it's still a small community. Still a small community. I know everyone. And we, we know everyone. I think that you know everyone as well. So it's like, we know, like, what the impact is of, like, us being home and, like, me being able to play. What's it like playing, like, you can play in front of your mom and dad? Or, like, your dad? To be honest, dude, I have, it's been a while since I've gotten nervous for a game. And I was really nervous this weekend. I was very nervous. I, I don't like to admit that, but I was very nervous. Just that because, means you kicked. Because, yeah, exactly. Because I wanted to do well for my family, for my friends. I didn't... Talk about that, you know, everyone is gonna be like, ah, he's not the same. And you know, it all comes down. Like you're at it, you you'll run into these guys or we'll go and have some drinks and then people start talking nonsense. So I was like, I need to make sure I at least do well enough that they're like, Oh, he played well. And uh and the most important thing is that people don't think that that's the biggest thing I told coach. I was like, I didn't want to come back here when I was like thirty six where I literally couldn't probably move or and and to be honest, I feel like I've taken well care of myself, like as far as my body itself, I'm thin. I think that's You've the gotten better at it, too. And I've gotten better at it, exactly. I've learned to take care of my body because before, like, I'd suffer a lot with these little muscle injuries and stuff. And to be honest, I've done well. I, this this season has been the first preseason I've gotten through with no injury since the past three years because I had an injury. Anytime you stop playing for two weeks and you then you back. fly over and then you try to go and start a season with a brand-new team that's already in season, all you're doing is catching up. So that was the biggest thing for me to make sure I had a full preseason, where I'm fit through my preseason, and then and then now I'm playing playing the season. What's coach uh, What's coach Rick like, dude? This guy is so funny. He's <laughs> I've always told him I he, he all he does is crack jokes. Like he's a great coach. He's a great person. He uh he 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 knows his football because he started he started a couple college programs that are very successful, and. Uh, and uh, he's very known in the in in like I would say the East Coast in a sense. I wanted to say just soccer, but he's known like through the East Coast for soccer. Yeah, he played for his national team Bermuda, Bermuda, Bermuda. Uh, oh, Bermuda. Bermuda. Yeah, he played nice. for Bermuda when he was growing up. Um, and he he knows the game. But the thing is, he makes he makes training so much fun. He 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 makes he makes he brings us together as players as a team. What do you what's what do you like about the team right now? You know, I love I love the dynamic of it. Like you have just a and couple of other, you so I played I, I played on the right wing, but kind of like coming inside as an attacking midfielder. Sometimes what depend on what the game is asking for. Yeah. But they give me that you, you But I'm used to you. playing just as a ten. I'm used to playing as a ten. But you know, I'll take on a different role, no problem. I've done that throughout my career as well. Um, but I love the dynamic because now I'm on the other side of things. I'm one of the older guys now. <laughs> Probably the second oldest guy on the team, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, because Leo Leo Castro, so we have a guy, he's Colombian, he's good, he's a striker, number nine tall. Bro, he is a baller. And so he played in South Africa most of his career. 
and he also played in the first division in Colombia. He's a baller, and 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 he's like the oldest. And then you have myself, who's thirty three. I'm probably I think I'm the second oldest to be honest. And then you have with a couple, two other guys out of the veterans, Evan Lee, Brand, Brandon Fricky, and then you got Typo, Tyler Pollack, and then you have. The next one would be Chapa, but Chapa's 27, and apparently that's veteran, and he's still young. <laughs> he and then played the first, him before. And like, we played in El Paso together, and uh, his story is actually really interesting. Um, and then you have a ton of young guys from 20 to 23, or 19, sorry, 18 to 23 is the rest of the guys. How do you feel you're moving with them? Bro, I still feel like I, I'm there. I'm competing with them. They know. They know. I'm very... I think what, what they're starting to learn about me, because we've only been... I'm very feisty. I get in people's faces. I'm very... But I do it the right way. I don't get in people's faces to be like be like me. I get in people's faces to like to hold them to a standard, because I know what it takes to, to be at top level. Not, not just to be at top level, to get to top level. Mm -hmm. Play at top level. Stay at top level. And... Uh, I feel like we have guys on my team that, that have potential to play at the next level. But as long as, you know how, when you're, we, we've all been young, we, we can lose yeah, lack of focus or anything, can change your career like that. And so that's been the biggest thing is for me to be that leader that, because our captain is Brandon Fricky and Evan Lee. Those are our two captains. Um, love those guys to death, good, good guys. And then kind of like the one that does like the, the dirty leadership, the one that's in people's faces and the one that's making sure that, People understand that I didn't come here for a vacation. I didn't come here to end my career. I I, I want to win. I play the game to win. Yeah, so I, I so I compete. I, I I love to compete. I love to get mad if 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 I believe the standard's not there. And so that's basically what I've been doing. Just kind of holding the guys to a stand to a different standard that they're maybe accustomed to. And uh, and I know all those things, all those little things. If 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 you fall in love with competing. And you fall in love with being with being passionate mm -hmm. about winning. If you merge those two things together, you become a monster. And and I've had the chance to like when I've gotten older, I've kind of tried to figure out like I've tried to learn from other people, like the best of the best. I watched the documentary, I think it was on Kobe Bryant. And the good guy to learn from. Um, and he, you know, the black mama, the, the one of the, the go, unbelievable. But one thing was was his mentality. It's kind of the same thing with Cristiano Ronaldo. Their mentality is completely different. Mm -hmm. And so maybe if I would have had that mentality when I was younger, who knows where I would have been. And so I think that's what I try to kind of take on that role where I learn for them to have that mentality. Yep. Who knows where their career will be. And I'll be that'll, that'll satisfy me now that I'm on the other side of my career. And yeah, we've been doing that, bro. And the team has looked, the team has looked very good. I remember the first meeting we had. It was so funny. We're all sitting there. First meeting we had, our captain spoke, and they were talking about, like, it was a transition year. Uh, like, it kind of gave, like, a crutch of, like, if things don't go well, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. worry. It's a transition year. It's a, it gives you, like, a little crutch. And I, and I was like, nah, nah. <laughs> I stopped the meeting right there, and then I was like, nah. I was like, that's not how this is going to go. I was like, listen, we don't have... Lionel Messi's in this league. We don't have incredible like players that can change the game like that. I was like, this is a blue collar league. Everyone is gonna be close to the same level, so it's all gonna come down as to your ability, how hard you work, and if you execute the plan. And if we all work towards that, yeah. then we can be a very good team. Especially, Especially. hard work and execute the plan. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 if, and then you add players, like yeah. like myself, you have these guys, we have a couple of young guys, they're very good. They've added a couple of young players that are very good. We have left. If you bring all that together and you bring that leadership, you bring that unity where everyone's going towards the same, same goal, mm -hmm. dude, that's when teams become very dangerous. And so I think I realized that we were actually losing 1-0 on the weekend, like in the first 10 minutes. Like we, it's one of our guys did a foul or something. It was like a PK, and I'm like, no, not the first game, not at home, not in front of my family. And the boys, like, you can just tell since we've been training at this level, boom, something turned on. We scored in the next two minutes, and then we went in on the second half, first five minutes, we scored two goals. Was... What What do you um like to the Greenville community? Like the support that, um, I mean, they have shown, but like you would like them to show throughout like your season first season here and you know the next couple of years you know uh somebody wrote me something 
in Spanish, and we, we were talk, I, it was kind of towards kind of like that same question. I think the biggest thing for me is like, I think for the parents and the people that maybe a lot of people haven't seen me play from the new 12 yeah. years from behind, that this is an opportunity literally for, for parents to bring their kids to, to see exactly what professional soccer looks like and to realize that the opportunities now are completely different from the opportunities from before. Before it was very difficult mm -hmm. to make it pro. You had to go through. You had to go to a first division college, which means you had to have very good grades. And on top of that, you had to play for a top top division college and get drafted. Yeah. Now there's professional academies. Every club, MLS club, has a professional academy. Every USL championship club is creating a, an academy. Now you have. Uh, now you have. Now you have. With these academies, that means your kid is always at an opportunity to be seen by yeah. somebody and be like, "Listen, this kid is very good." bring him to the academy, he can be the next big thing, or he could, and so I think the biggest thing is like, get parents to bring their kids, because maybe it could plant a seed yep. that changes the, the mindset of what a kid wants, or, or what a kid dreams, because at the end of it, it's a dream. If you think about how many players there is around the world, how many professional, it's only like a 1% of players get to play professionally. Yeah, or probably smaller. Yeah. Even, to be honest, even smaller, smaller yeah. just so people have an idea. And if there's more opportunities for it, then there may, that means that parents should expose them more to it. Yeah, and, and, the, so, and the U.S. has grown. Up. And the U, U.S. Bro, the infrastructure. Every country I think in the world wants to try to change their soccer leagues to the U.S. infrastructure because I've always said the same thing: when U.S. does things, they do things the right way, <laughs> and they do things. They, 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 I mean, they, we've they, already seen it, I think, too, like the level of play. And MLS, even on our national team, like the training guys, facilities, bro. Yeah, facility. We're talking, we're talking about seventy, eighty million dollar training facilities, man. But you, you don't get that at you don't get that at other clubs, bro. They were ranking Real Salt Lake's new tra training facility that they opened up a couple years ago. They were ranking as fifth in the world. Dang. So you can see, because people, bro, you know the how Miami was probably gonna be crazy. I'm sure the <laughs> Miami one is nasty. So that's what I'm saying. The infrastructure of the way things America, America does things is always the best mm -hmm. way. And we got the World Cup coming. And so, and I think that's going to change everything as well. So right now is the time for parents to take time out of their day on a Saturday. Bring your families, bring your kids, and let them watch a game. And give give them that 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 little tunnel vision where they can be like, the kid can be like, oh my God, I want to play yeah. for Green Road Triumph. You're day. doing a great job, like, being involved in the youth like leagues in the community so far too. Yeah, dude, I've been here for like three weeks, or four weeks now, and I've I've went and seen Strapo's team. I've seen a couple more teams, and we've we've made a couple of fans. To be honest, I was surprised by the amount of kids that are out there. And to be honest, one thing that's coming up next for me is I'm trying to figure out where I can start my own little training facility thing, or not even training facility, my own little field, and I'm gonna start training kids individually. And I'm gonna I want to give them the ins and outs of what it really takes to be professional. Until you play professional, you don't know yeah. what it takes to be a professional. I had a different thought process when I was young. I thought it was playing on TV, making some money, being famous, and getting all the girls. <laughs> getting I the thought, girls. Getting the girls. I thought that, that was the, the pro level thing. <laughs> it's not, bro. It's, it's completely different. A couple of those things are still involved, but bro, your food at the... Your, your